morning. It is Monday, August 2nd. I'm Jessica Lovell. Welcome into the morning medical update. Today we are looking back on the early days of COVID-19. We're going to hear from Dr. Damian Stevens. He volunteered in New York City in the height of the pandemic. He joins Chief Medical Officer Dr. Steve Stites to compare what he experienced then to what we are now seeing here in Missouri and Kansas. But first, let's get to the COVID count with Dr. Data Hawkinson. Good morning to you. How yeah. were we looking Hi. over the weekend? You know, we've still been staying steady as far as our active numbers here in the hospital in that mid 30s range for active infections. Today we have 38 um, active infections with 15 in the ICU and nine of those on the ventilator. We still have 14 additional patients in that recovery period, but certainly our active infections are, are greatly uh, increased above that recovery. Total of 52 patients then in the hospital. Hayes has, I think their highest number that I remember um, since the pandemic, uh, could be wrong, but they have nine active infections with one intubated as well. All right, we'll talk with Dr. Stites here in just a moment. Do we have reporters on the line? All right, so get your community questions sent in right now. We're going to get those answered for you here shortly, but let's get to Dr. Stites and Dr. Damian Stevens. He is also a pulmonary specialist and a critical care and sleep specialist as well. So good morning to both of you. Good weekends. Yeah, great morning. Good, yes. yeah. Too short. I always, not, uh, but a lot going on. So I just kind of want you to get us started. Yeah, you know, there is a lot going on. And, and first of all, uh, kudos to those who have put on their mask and gone back out. I was in a couple of grocery stores this weekend and because, uh, you know, I always forget something. And so uh, I was 80 to 90% of people were masked. Went out to one restaurant, eh, not as much masking going on, so it's a little hit and miss. So, I, I, But I kudos to those who are putting the mask back on because clearly we have got to do that. Uh, the, the data coming out from Friday and kind of also out through the weekend about what's actually happened in Provincetown, Massachusetts. So Provincetown's an interesting community. It was 95% vaccinated. Had a lot of summer tourists come in. It's at the tip of Cape Cod, and it's kind of a, a cool place. I've not been there, but at least people were describing it. <laughs> the pictures look great. But um, you know, the interesting dynamic is that with all these people vaccinated, a lot of people came in to town, and, and then there was a big spike in coronavirus, and it was the Delta coronavirus that drove it. Um, both vaccinated and unvaccinated people um, getting sick. Fortunately, most of the people who got hospitalized were those who are unvaccinated, showing that the vaccines still work. And even in those per our data here at KU, we've seen a, a big number, a big increase in our uh, numbers of uh, COVID patients. 90% of them are unvaccinated. Only about 5 or 10% are vaccinated. And those who are vaccinated tend not to ever end up in the ICU or die or things like that. So we know the vaccine is still very effective against the Delta virus or the Delta variant. But what we should be concerned about is the ability of, patient, of people vaccinated or unvaccinated to spread the virus around. And, and even though you're, you're probably reduced by about 50% if you're vaccinated to be, uh, in, in terms of your ability to shed and spread, as we say here on the, on the MMU, um, it's still there. And, and it's, it's, it's significant and it can be passed around. And I think that's why it's so important to put masks back on. Also, a, a, a good stu uh, uh, report in the um, uh, MMWR in the, from the CDC looking at the rise in RSV and other respiratory viruses at the same time as co with COVID in children. And I think what we need to just acknowledge is, A, Delta virus is taking the lives of those who are very young. Um, B, uh, th there is another outbreak now of RSV and some other viruses in the community. C, our numbers are steady, but that's partly because we're turning down a lot of transfers because we're so full of everything else. D, every hospital in Kansas City is incredibly full. We had CMO calls last week, and I think what we're hearing is that we're all full. We all feel feel like we're comfortable. We all think we're going to have to, go, we're going to, have to start thought, talking about visitor numbers and, and other restrictions again. E, Springfield continues to go up. You know, they'd hit a low point, but now Cox reported over the weekend that the numbers had got started to uh, go back up again. I think I'm on F. What that means is we need everyone to help us. And just as a few of the grocery store folks had seen, we, we saw in some of the grocery store of the weekend, people putting their masks back on. I know Kansas City starts today, but man, the whole darn area, we need to have our masks back on because that we know can bend and break this curve. Hospitals are full. There are a lot of sick people out there. There. Kids are getting sick, and if we're going to really stay safe against this variant and against all the other viruses out there, we need to put our masks back on and make sure folks get vaccinated. We've said before, this is the pandemic of the unvaccinated. What we're seeing is that all of us can spread the disease, 
those who are unvaccinated are most at risk for increased injury and death and long haul syndrome. And so all the things you don't want to have. And does that so, feel at all like what happened when he would start it back in New York yes, a long exactly. time ago? Yes, I agree with that entirely. That's exactly, exactly correct. Yeah. I want to talk about that. I just want to tell you, you know, we went in the archives and we pulled up the old back in the freezer video with you guys. Yeah, we're ready to go again. Let's go back to the freezer. <laughs> okay. Well, I'll, okay. So that sounds kind of good I, in that degree day. That. It's hot. Let's just jump. We're going to shove you two back in the freezer, but in the meantime, we're going to replay that yeah. video at the end just to kind of go along with your masking and why they work and why it's so and important to have them on. So. Yes. I just want people to stay tuned until the end of the show for that one. Uh, all right, so Dr. Stevens, you and I did a story way back when, it feels yeah, like, almost a year and a half year ago, ago. When, uh -huh. you, when you were just back from New York City. Um, so just in general, what was it like there? What what did you see? What, it was, it was take a, us there. It was a city in crisis. You know, you can think of Kansas City, everybody on the street and going out to dinner, going to shows, and there was no one on the street. You'd walk down the street, would cross one person's path, you know, every few minutes. There's the video showing it now. Now. It was the fear, you know, uh, people were afraid to, to get on a subway, to get on a bus. That, if you think how far back that was, that was a time we were talking about not having masks. Mm -hmm. You know, PPE was the big issue. That's kind of what's sad about this whole process. You, if you compare what today versus that a year and a half ago, we've gone from where we were worried about not having masks to now we have a vaccine that a significant percent of the population won't take. Right. <laughs> so that's if you'd asked me a year and a half ago, I thought we'd be at this point, I would have said, you know, you're crazy. There's no way we'd be to that. But, yeah, that's where we're sitting now is we have a vaccine. We don't necessarily have a cure for it, but we have a prevention for it that a big part of, portion of the population does yeah. not take. You mentioned the streets, because I think you were telling me when you'd walk from your hotel uh, to back, the, to the, back to the uh, uh, hospital, hospital every morning, it was just super eerie to just okay. not, just the look on people's faces was yep. different. The, the few people you saw, what kind of patient care were you giving? What was it like? You know, we had uh, ventilators as, as opposed to a standard ventilator we would use in ICU. We have what we call portable ventilators. We are running out of nurses, running out of respiratory therapists. So there was definitely shortage of those things. Um, that was back when we did not know what medication helped, if any medications helped. So we were doing a lot of studies with different drugs at that point. Um, but, you know, the, you would have family members that would come drop a family member off at the ER and never see them again. You know, because family members weren't allowed to come to the hospital. Um, they would Skype, they'd get on the phone and say goodbye. And we had a truck out in front, actually three trucks in front of the hospital there that were the freezer trucks for bodies. And I think that's what so many of us remember when we think of the early days was yeah. New York, um, the bodies, the trucks out front. Dr. Yeah. Seitz, what do you remember? Because there were so many unknowns back then. Yeah, I think I remember we were all huddled around the phone here without infection control precautions. <laughs> and I kind of ever, you, you look back at that, yeah. and it makes you, it's a little cringeworthy. Mm -hmm. You know, um, I remember the fear of the unknown and the shutdown and the so social isolation for folks, which we have learned has been incredibly challenging. We watched suicide rates go up. We watched depression rates go up. Up. So what I think the lesson we have to learn is that we don't want to go back there. Yes. The way to not go back there is to get more people vaccinated, to put masks on. If you think about it, putting a mask on is a simple act of faith, mm -hmm. right? It's faith in science. It's faith in ourselves. It's faith in each other. It's an act of grace that we're showing to everyone because we want to keep everybody else safe. Um, and I think it, it is a simple act. It, it, do we like wearing masks? Well, of course not. We don't like to wear masks. It's, 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 it's a pain. It's a pain even when you're in the operating room and you're doing a surgery. Do you really want to wear a mask? No, not really. But you wear the mask because you know that it keeps patients safe. It keeps each other safe. And I think that's the key. We have got to bend the curve again mm -hmm. because you don't want that tension and that stress back in the original part of the pandemic. And what we need to be nervous about is that if we continue to shed and spread the virus to an unvaccinated population, we still give more and more opportunity for the mm -hmm. variant, another variant to come on, you know, mm -hmm. the gamma variant, the lambda variant, mm -hmm. which could be even harder than the delta variant. We don't want that, and we know how to pre prevent that curve. And I think, Hawkeye, you, you, I know that's got to be music to your heart there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, we know how to do it. Um, we have shown that it is a Swiss cheese model. It is more things than just vaccination. Vaccination does an excellent job at protecting against the spectrum of COVID-19. All of those disease uh, uh, symptoms and progression to <laughs> severe disease, 
hospitalization death, but it's also those other things, masking, distancing. Um, we know that we know how to create a safe environment in the schools and keep the kids in the schools and keep those adults working in the schools and not ill and not bringing it home to their family. And it is the issues of masking and distancing and good airflow throughout those uh, rooms and that engineering as much as you can do it in those individual school places. So we know it's a combination of all those um, and it's not just one thing, but it is everything together to be able to stop the spread of this disease. I have to ask you also, what, what do you remember most from just those early images of COVID, New York City, what we were yeah. seeing um, as we were learning as we went every single day? Yeah, I mean, it, it was pretty astounding and it was in New York City and then it was down in Louisiana and Detroit and you know, Damien was certainly brave. I think we had discussions about that before he left. Uh, that should was he really go or should he stay? Yeah. yeah. Remember that. <laughs> so, um, you know, nobody wants to go back to that. We know, unfortunately, we've seen our neighbors uh, down in Springfield. It's that has been happening to them down there now. Um, but we know how to stop it and we, we know how to do it. Hopefully this is the impetus for everybody to who are vaccine hesitant or, or not want to get the vaccine to get the vaccine because now it isn't just learning what are the details and asking those questions. Now people are being affected by this and they are seeing tragedy in their own lives and with people around them. And I think that is um, helping to drive some of these new uh, vaccine increases that we've been seeing. So what if I just want to say, I think one of our challenges we have for recognizing Kansas City is our curves are still rising. Yeah. So we've been flat, but we, we, what's going on in the community, remember our census lags about two weeks beyond where we were. The Delta virus has really taken off in this city here. And, and we know that, A, because we have a lot more of our own employees who went out, right? I mean, we went from like three or four up to 68 or something on last Friday. So over about a month's period of time, we really... So, and, and that's true for all health systems around, and it's true for the community. If you step back and look at the number of new cases um, per day and the seven-day rolling average, you know it's quadrupled over the last month here in the city. We're over 600 again. It's the highest peak we've had since the worst part of this month's fall. It beats the one from last March and April. It beats the one from the summer. It's and, and it's and, and it's still an exponential rise. And, and yeah, this is our hotspot curve, and you can see the Kansas City. And this is the danger zone curve, and this is a combination of low vaccination rate plus a lot of delta. The virus, that deep purple, right where we are, that deep purple region. And if you think about the map a few weeks ago, it didn't look anything like that. It looked down around Springfield. It's spreading out from Springfield, going now down to the coast, down into Florida. And there's another big nidus out west. You look at that map and you're like, yeah, we're, we're kind of at the epicenter of this wave. That's not who and what you want to be. And we're seeing it more in our, in our, so what does that mean? It means that we're going to have to face difficult choices down the road. If we don't make the choice to mask now, to bend the curve, if we don't make that choice, remember Springfield didn't make that choice. So if we don't make the choice, what it means is we're going to make another choice later on, which is how do we take care of all those other people with a time-sensitive diagnosis? Say you're having a heart attack, say you're having a stroke, say you're having a motor vehicle accident, and we can't get to you fast enough because our emergency rooms are full of COVID patients. If we hit that point, then we all suffer from this lack of taking a simple act. And I know, again, I know there's a lot of political controversy over that. You know what? You just got to get over it, people. You just got to get over that. This is not a political issue. This is a medical issue. Let's keep it where it is. Let's keep each other safe. And we got to get over the politics of it because it's just not true. I think you have to say that every day. I think. That's get I like over you're here. the politics of the masking today. and just put it on because it clearly yes. works. You wouldn't want your surgeon breathing all over your wound. You don't want people breathing over a Delta virus, which only takes about two minutes to four minutes to spread, unlike the original strain, which took 12 minutes of direct contact. Well just, well, just to say that the act of wearing a mask impinges on your personal freedom is just no. no shoot, no shirt, no shirt. What is it? No shoot. No, sh no shirt, yes. no shoes, no service. Yes. No mask, no service. Yeah. Just add it in. Just add it in. Dare I ask, do you, either of you fear, just with what we're seeing, not to be a scare factor, that we could ever see anything that looked anything similar to what we saw in New York City those early days? Oh, I think there's a possibility of that. We do yeah. too. Really? Especially if this variant, again, the Delta virus is so much more contagious. Yeah. And remember that even if you've been vaccinated, 
you still have a very high, unlike the original, you still have a high par, uh, count in your airway. And then, it, again, the CDC says, and it was all indoors, by the way. I, I looked hard through the CDC data. I don't know, Hawk, if you got anything different. But I only saw indoor cases. I didn't see it. it, it and, and Provincetown was crowded. Mm-hmm. Didn't see any references to outdoor spread there. So I think it's still more indoor than yeah. outdoor, much more indoor than outdoor. So outside, much safer. But... You know, it's this shortened time and the fact that asymptomatic, that you may be very well be asymptomatic when you've had been vaccinated and you may still be shutting the virus and spreading it, that makes you say we all need to be masked. Well, I think the other big variable, which you, Dr. Stites, already referred to, we're talking about Delta. We don't know another a fourth and a fifth yeah. version mm-hmm. of the virus that could take us back to that. You know? So let's shut it down. Yeah, I mean, there, there was an allusion to a reference to indoor and outdoor gatherings, but I would suspect most of those are going to be those indoor gatherings there in that CDC report. Yep. Uh, Dr. Stevens, just why I have you here, sleep mm-hmm. specialist, any issues with sleep and COVID? How, help us make that connection. A lot of patients aren't sleeping because of stress. That's what, that's what I see by and large. Um, there's not a lot of you know interaction specifically between COVID and sleep, but that's the big thing. It's part of that you know uh, isolation, you know uh, worried financial, you know not having a paycheck. Um, what's happening to the family now? We've got the whole thing about schools starting yeah. that everyone's going to be you know up at night thinking about what do we do. How does that, how, what are the repercussions? And what about burnout from healthcare providers? What are you Absolutely. seeing as far as that goes? Huge, huge amount of burnout. Nursing. Now the thing that I've had several physicians in town, friends, and even out of town have spoken to, now nurses, doctors, everyone has this conflict of, you know, you did not get vaccinated. Now I'm in ICU. I'm intubating you. I'm taking care of you. I'm watching you kind of slowly die before my eyes when if you had gotten a vaccination, this could have all been preventable. And that's the big kind of new. We've gone from almost more fear to frustration with a lot of the medical staff. We have masks now. We have, you know, uh, gowns, gloves, and we're able to protect ourselves by and large. And now the vast majority of healthcare providers are vaccinated. So the healthcare team, like I said, has kind of gone from more this fear to frustration because I know that the majority of these cases could have been prevented. As Dr. Stite said, they may yeah. still get infection. They're, they're not in the hospital. They're not in the ventilator. They're not in ICU. And I'm watching that patient, uh, you know, sicker, sicker, watching their husband, their wife, their children deal with all this. And I'm sitting there thinking, oh, my God, if you'd had a vaccination, you probably wouldn't be here. And I think that's that hotspot map. That's where we see the numbers continuing to rise in our areas. There's a lack of vaccination. There's like so we can all, people who are very vulnerable and could I say 95% of patients who are hospitalized here and across the country are unvaccinated. So yeah, there are a few vaccinations. A lot of the who people who come in the hospital, but it's like five percent, and the deaths are like one or two percent vaccinated and 98% unvaccinated. There's no question the vaccine still works. There's also no question that we know how to bend or break that curve. Yeah, I mean, there's nothing to add for that. We we have to keep doing the right things. And- Can I just say that Betsy just said it. She says, I'm finally fully vaccinated. I was a little nervous with my adrenaline insufficiency and was afraid of bad side effects, but I did great. And she nice. said, only a sore arm and a headache, but she has both shots and she's all good to go. We were talking yes. a little bit about the difference between vaccine hesitancy and vaccine resistance. The other day on the show, there's a big difference. Some people just need to get there a little quicker, but I always you know, love to. It wouldn't be interesting, so just, just as a plug for a future program, I, uh, I've got a couple of vaccine hesitant patients who have converted and it'd be interested to bring in some people and talk mm-hmm. with them about mm-hmm. why'd you change your mind? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Because I think people need to know there are people changing their minds and what we're seeing is that folks are scared of the Delta virus and that even the vaccination rate in Missouri was up by 50% mm-hmm. over the last, yeah. couple, last couple of weeks yeah. and it's because folks are a little nervous about the Delta variant, yeah. right. as they should be. Yes. Sure. I just like to celebrate it and share it and yeah, help absolutely. other people, other people who are hesitant yeah, right now yeah. know that people Don't are get vaccinated. jumping off the fence. We're going to get to some community questions. Are you good? Can we do that now? I'm ready. All right, let's do it. So Jill's out of town. We mentioned that last week, but he's in the flesh today. Bob Hallinan. Good morning. Happy Monday. How are you? Great. Thanks. Got some questions already uh, lined up for you. Let's do it. <laughs> okay. Shirley asks, can a vaccinated person who is unsymptomatic with COVID or Delta spread it to another vaccinated person? And if so, can that person have symptoms and test positive? Yes, yes, and yes. <laughs> yeah, because that's the whole problem, Hawk, that's with this, the... this, this, this particular, with the Delta variant, is that the number of vaccine 
uh, are there vaccines? Sorry, the number of viral uh, viruses inside your airway can be almost or as high as somebody who's unvaccinated. We weren't sure if you could shed and spread uh, that virus, but in the Provincetown data, uh, the CDC referenced last week um, is is pretty clear that it, in fact it can happen, and an asymptomatic person may give it to another person, and that person may or may become not become uh, symptomatic. Uh, the other thing, just to say, is that's really why the CDC uh, changed direction here and went right back to saying we should all have masks on indoors. Mm -hmm. So <clears throat> you don't have to wait for your local government to do it. The CDC's already said mask indoors, Hawkeye, because yeah. of this spread that can happen with asymptomatic patients. Yeah, I mean, certainly there are caveats with that uh, morbidity and mortality weekly report study from Provincetown, Massachusetts. Obviously, it's kind of a retrospective study, kind of looking back at contact tracing and the number of people who were vaccinated and infections and all overall cases. You know, we'd still like to have some more of the basic science. Really, what is that, uh, the viral, uh, uh, um, the viral load that you're replicating if you are vaccinated. Is it everybody who's re uh, replicating the same amount? We certainly know for regular COVID without vaccination that some people do replicate more and maybe are more uh, of, of those spreaders compared to other people. But that is the whole premise of that, uh, that report and why the masking recommendations were changed because they saw that there were so many people, there was such a high percentage of vaccinated people who were able to spread it and who also were asymptomatic still spreading it. So, you know, there still are a lot of questions we would like to answer. I'm sure some of those questions are going to get answered. Really, what is the viral load um, and how much of that is infectious in those vaccinated people for how long? But that is the premise of why the masking recommendations have been changed. Diana asked, there's been a few articles lately saying that cloth masks do not work against the Delta variant and that people should go back to N95 masks. Any truth to this? You know, I, I think what it was saying is not that they don't work. Yeah. That's not a true statement. It, it's that they don't work as well as they did with the with the original variant. But the problem is that w no matter what you do, the Delta variant is more transmissible, and that's why it's important to try and wear the highest quality mask you can. can. I don't know that everyone needs to go back to um, an N95 mask. In fact, I would say you probably don't. I think that's true for what we call aerosolized generating procedures, but aerosol generating procedures. But I think that for the most folks, a good mask will still reduce the spread. I think even a good cloth mask can help reduce the spread. But if you've got the simple surgical masks that you can get in the store, those are even better. Huh? That's yeah. what I was just going to ask. Yeah, you. I would agree. I mean, we know that just inherently an N95 mask offers more protection than cloth <clears> masking. <throat> uh, we have seen that throughout this pandemic. The other issue is, you know, if you can get everybody to be doing something, some sort of barrier, whether that's cloth or, or N95, you know, even surgical mask, um, I don't think everybody has to go to an N95. Just like you said, certainly we've seen some stories where experts are calling that everybody should be wearing an N95 mask, um, but, you know, we still do know and understand that, you know, if you're vaccinated, if you're wearing masks, if you're going into those places where other people are wearing masks, you're going to have that barrier protection. Also, those masks are going to offer you some protection against the virus as well. Bob? All right. Isaac says, I saw that vaccine rates in Missouri and Kansas have picked, have picked up lately. How long is this going to take to have any effect on the case figures if there's going to be any effect at all? Yeah, the problem is that that's a few folks every day, and it isn't a few yeah. folks. It's not. I, I sound like I'm kind of underplaying a little bit, but a, it takes six weeks from your first shot to really get full immunity, and that's providing you get your second shot. And we know the Delta variant; you really need both shots, and so don't count on the things like with the original variant. You can get one shot and say after two weeks you're actually doing pretty well. You really have to have both shots. Second thing is it, it's an increase in numbers, but it's not a light switch. We can't just turn it on and turn it off, and so we would have to get everybody vaccinated at least 85 percent of people vaccinated really rapidly. Putting a mask on, on the other hand, is like a light switch. Mm -hmm. We can all do it. We can all do it easily. We can all do it rapidly, Hawkeye. And I think that's the, that, that's the big advantage to the mask. Yeah, and I think if we're, if we're doing that combination, you know, hopefully this current surge will not last too long and certainly will not peak and be as high uh, as it was in December and January. But I, th I think it's, again, continues to be the combination but continue to get as many people vaccinated, um, especially if they've recently had 
COVID-19. We've also seen more and more reports about if you were previously infected and you get at least one dose, at least your antibody levels are going to be higher. Uh, we don't know how that correlates with protection, but, um, but that is a good start. We need to keep taking those one day at a time, step by step, getting everybody vaccinated. Dr. Stevens, what's your masking philosophy right now? Are you back That's, to masking or? Oh yeah. Always. I mean, like I said, it's uh, easy. It's not a, you know, on a 95 degree day, it's not the most blessed thing to do, but it's something that everybody can do. You know, it's, uh, you can have the debate about vaccine and side effects. What's the side effect of a mask, you know? <laughs> Pretty simple. Yep. Bob? Sure seems like it. All right. Allie is asking, what about indoor workouts in public places? Should this be paused until the cases are down? Okay, Hawkeye, which one of us going to go get controversial now? <laughs> I'll let you start. Okay, thank you. <laughs> All right, so here's the thing. The CDC has not said anything about de-densifying yet. Yeah. And I, I think what they're doing is they're going to wait and see if we get our masks back on and if vaccination rates are enough to buffer. You know what Fauci said over the weekend, I think is right. We we have about half of the now. Unfortunately, in some areas, and like Springfield, where things got way out of whack, or even here in our area, where it's starting to get, we're, we're teetering. Um, you know, we're hoping that the base vaccination rate will keep hospitals not as full, and so we don't have to de-densify. Mm -hmm. We know that businesses, especially things like restaurants and theaters and things, were so struggling that nobody really wants to go back to de-densifying those public spaces. And so I think what we are hoping is that vaccination and masking will keep our community safe as long as we're all participating in it. If it doesn't, the next step is to de-densify. Now, here's what I would say about indoor workouts. I would not go into a facility right now in which people weren't masked and they're working out indoors. It's just, that's like a, that's a spread of theme right there. That's a new word, a spread of theme. I don't know where that came from. But that's like, a, that's a spread party right there. And, and, I, and I would say to you though, if people are masked, I would feel more comfortable. Mm -hmm. I've been still working out outside. I still feel more comfortable working out outside. If I work out inside, I'm at my house. And, uh, um, I really, I, I think it's that, that heavy, you know, your heavy exertion, you're going to breathe hard. And um, if you get moist and wet, you defeat the, the, the mask you have. Uh, so I'm a little nervous about indoor workouts right now. I'd be nervous about indoor concert, concerts, indoor singing, uh, things where people are shouting and screaming because I think it's just, you just got to be careful inside right now, Hawkeye. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I started wearing my mask back at the gym uh, three, three and a half weeks ago because of that. You know, we'll try to work out when it is less busy, uh, but, you know, we need to continue to do things uh, for our health. You know, but still there's, it's nice weather out so you can still be walking outside. It's still nice out so you can still be eating outside, doing those things outside. I would continue to do as much outdoors as you can. Uh, but I think it's important to understand what kind of risk do you want and understand that environment that you're going into. Also, more than likely, 100% of those people in any particular given area are not going to be fully vaccinated. Nancy wants to know, she says, if you could just clarify this for her, her, she says, I've heard or read that masks aren't as efficient in stopping the Delta variant. You just kind of mentioned that. So is it really safe for these young kids that are not vaccinated to go back to school? Um, oh, okay, so, so stay questions. tuned it toward the end of the week, Jess. We're going to have a big talk yeah. about it. Big thing about that. This is going to pop up on our radar. Mm -hmm. You know, I think, um, look, here's what we know. In crowded indoor spaces, you are absolutely safer if you wear a mask. Mm -hmm. Right? That's just, that is, yep. that is not a debate any longer. You are safer if you mask. Then it becomes a question of are kids better off masked? When I say better off, are you overcoming enough of the depression, the, 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 the suicide, the, the issues that, you know, from social isolation that have really affected teenagers especially yeah. by having them in school yet masked? And, and, and so I, I it to probably make a little bit of a local judgment, but, you know, I, I'll tell you what, I, I just don't think there's any question, Hawkeye, that masking makes people safer yeah. inside. Yeah, you know, we still, I still get emails about this and debates. Masking doesn't work. Masking isn't safe. You know, that's, that is absolutely not true. We remember the CDC guidance uh, and especially for opening schools safely. 
is based on that fact. We know that the Academy, American Academy of Pediatrics recommends for masking for all those kids, especially if they're five and above, who can tolerate masking. We know masking helps. There is a plethora of research out there. So I think to say that masking doesn't work or is not helpful it is not true to the science. Um, in addition, I'm not sure any basic science which shows that masking doesn't work for Delta variant. Certainly we don't believe that the virus has changed in size. The droplets really aren't changed in size. So the mask should still provide the benefit um, that we have seen before. But also remember, it's not just masking, it is distancing as much as possible in vaccination. But overall, masking has been shown and proven to be safe. We have great, um, great references, great research, even from um, KU, uh, our doctors, Dr. Ginther. Ginther has uh, uh, produced and published very good uh, data about Kansas in masking mandates and counties with masking mandates or communities with masking mandates versus counties without, and shown great reductions in the spread of the disease as well. Hey, can we put Damien on the spot for a minute? Absolutely. Damien, you, you have, your kids are young. I have a, teenagers, right? I have a senior and a junior, and they both have been vaccinated, and they both are planning on wearing masks. And you know I ask these questions. <clears throat> it's all because I have a five-year-old, too, and I, I feel the pain and the fear just like all these people asking. I know these questions come in all the time, but I think somebody's wanting some magic answer. <laughs> but yeah, you want the magic answer. It's everyone. the magic. There is no there magical is no answer. answer. I know. But there is a medically best practice answer, and the best practice is to be masked. All right. Well, we're going to keep know? asking you anyway. You go right ahead. I'll keep saying the same thing. <laughs> I know. I know. Keep reminding him. All right. Bob. All right. Cindy says... With a lot of companies requiring vaccinations of staff, including a couple of hospitals here in the metro area, where does the KU Health System stand on that? Yeah, that's a very fair question, and uh, um, we're, we are actively discussing it. We, our policy had been that until it was an FDA-approved drug, we weren't going to require it, and I, I was actually pretty comfortable with that. The Delta variant is changing that debate, and we're having it internally now to, to talk a, a, a about that. I will say that, um, especially in our front-facing staff, that is, people who are directly taking care of COVID patients, that the vaccination rate is very high already. I mean, we're, we, our, our residents are around that 95%, our medical staff is about 85%, I believe the nursing staff, especially on COVID units, is up around that same level. Um, there are some areas of our hospital that is not, you know, some of our work at home folks are not as highly vaccinated. So we're trying to get everybody vaccinated. We're up to about 75% right now. Plus, we think there are some people who have been vaccinated out. That's just the ones we know about. That is through, through our EMR, our, our employee health system. System. We know that percentage is true. We think there's an additional percentage that have probably been vaccinated. We're not sure because they got vaccinated at home. So we think we're pretty high already, um, but we are actively discussing whether or not we're going to uh, jump to mandatory vaccination, even while we're still under an early use authorization. All right, Joanne, here's one that just won't go away. Joanne says, a doctor told my sister not to get her 18-year-old daughter the vaccine it's been causing infertility. Is this true? Oh my God! How many, no. how many times we have? It's still no. out there. No, <laughs> no. So can we put a stake yes. through this you one? Know, this is yes. All, you know, End it. If, if it was a physician, I, I think it's time to maybe change who your physician is. Or, or <laughs> no. uh, God, <laughs> I'm with you though. You know, I had to deal with this. Um, there was uh, an employee on on the floors uh last week who i had had to speak with she was concerned about her daughter getting it and their pediatrician said you don't need to get it uh coronavirus doesn't affect children um <clears throat> this is absolutely false information um this is untrue I, I would really seriously consider finding new uh physicians or primary care uh for that new pediatricians because this is absolutely false um, this is another very good campaign of disinformation and misinformation. There is no evidence to suggest that the vaccines cause infertility. There's no microchips in the vaccines. This continues to be a um, vaccine, anti-vaccine misinformation campaign, basically. I, what he said, I'm what 100 said. aboard. Let's, hope, uh, that wait, put, oh, let's hope this puts an end to that one, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah no. doubt it. Doubt it. No. It'll be no. back. Yeah. So wait, I have to ask Autumn, Autumn's question. Hey, can I, I just ask something? Nobody's asked me yet if vaccinations cause baldness. <laughs> you, you think, don't you think? Don't you think they we should? We just assumed. We assumed it did. Well, I think that must be the answer. <laughs> we that just assumed. Vaccinated. Bob. 
Come on. Okay, so I, I do need to ask this for Autumn. She said, apologies, I missed her answer on this. She mentioned concerts, um, concerns about concerts, indoor concerts. What's your opinion about the safety of going to the big Garth Brooks concert at a full Arrowhead, even if you're fully vaccinated? Yeah, okay, so... That's a lot of people. Um, yeah, 58,000. So it won't be a totally full air. Right? Full is 80,000. That's a lot so of Garth Brooks 70, fans. It's, it's a lot of Garth Brooks fans. It is outside, though, and I think that's the win. I think it's outside. That makes it a lot safer. Um, I, you know, the question is, are you going to sing along with Garth? Absolutely. Yeah, see, I think that's a, that's concern number one. Number two, are you going to be masked outside? Mm -hmm. uh, I think if you're in a, here's my personal preference. Okay. If you're in a really big public space like that with a whole lot of people, I think I'm going to wear a mask yeah. if I'm there. And um, if I'm there, and I think that, um, that I may be there, and if so, I'm going to have a mask on. But... I, I think that's a challenging question, Hawkeye. Yeah. What, what, what would you do about yeah. it? If you're outside, now clearly if you're inside, inside you're going to the bathroom and put your mask on. But yeah. what about your You know, state? outside, again, um, actually this weekend I went to an outdoor venue. Um, yeah. well, it was small. It wasn't as big as Arrowhead, obviously. But I felt safe where I was in that area that I was. Um, I was kind of up and away and six feet or more from other people. So I, I felt pretty safe. Obviously, we know the wind currents um, there. Uh, outdoors are much better than indoors so I felt safe understanding uh, you know Arrowhead is a big area you will probably be separated for the most part from around other people um, unless there is for instance like a pit area where there's no specific seats but you are all crammed together I think you're a little bit more dense at that point in time you're a little bit closer together probably easier to spread but I would think areas such as seats or in, in the walkways or or, or things of that nature, you're probably going to be safe. Um, just understand what is that situation around you. I was really bummed because I have really bad nosebleed seats mm -hmm. when I bought these tickets a long time ago. Now I'm happy. They're they all the way the place to be. They're at the yeah. top. You're the, you're well, the hot ticket. They're yeah. at the rim of Arrowhead. I'm looking down That's on awesome. everyone. You're probably the safest person I know. I was like, wait, I did this right for you once. So. Well, this Good. is also one of those things. We're going to have more information over time. What? Chicago, they had the Lollapalooza last week. And yeah. if there's a huge outbreak, we stay We're tuned. Say, we may find out. Yeah. How safe or unsafe some of these massive outdoor events are. And if you ask me if I want to go to the Chiefs so. game, the answer is, you know, actually, I do. But yeah. I might like the Chiefs yeah. more than Garth Brooks. What? You know, I still, I I still believe you're, you're probably going to be safer if there is any viral spread. It's not going to be um, too far down from where you're going just because mostly because of that turbulent air that's flowing and just um, dispersing very, very low concentrations of droplets. Um, I think for the most part it's going to be safe. Now we know Sturgis, the motorcycle rally is going to be going on or is going yes. on currently. But in that case, a lot of people are going into those bars and restaurants and meeting together. Um, I think it is a lot different than just an isolated outdoor event, which again, I think for the most part, it's going to be safe for more people. Now, if you have other comorbid conditions, even if you're vaccinated, at that point, you should consider, again, still wearing a mask. Bob? All right. What happened here? Okay, Cindy says, I went for a COVID test at a local pharmacy recently, and I was surprised to learn it would be self-administered. Does that impact the reliability of the results versus being administered by a professional? I don't like those. I don't <laughs> think so. You know, I've had to get tested for, um, for travel or things of that nature. Uh, once or twice and um, it was self-administered um, I think that's mostly the antigen test but but I could be wrong um, you know I don't see necessarily a, a problem with that it's it is just a different test it's a different platform um, certainly for the PCR tests if I've had to take them here it's been administered by a professional who's been doing it but um, overall I, I don't think it's a problem I don't think it's a, such a bad if you just want to do a screening test. I think yeah. if you really would want to know, you still need a nasal PCR. Yeah. And, and I'm just biased because of the early data and the antigen testing, though I think it's probably gotten better. Mm -hmm. it, there, there is some, even if you um, are going to do like a saliva swab or something, there is a little bit of operator error that can occur. And if you don't follow the stuff exactly, or if you're not quite sure how you're doing it, you may introduce yet another error into a test that may not already be quite as good as a nasal swab. So if you really need to know, if you're, like if, you have, if you're symptomatic, you just got to go do a nasal PCR. Well, I like this question because I had to give my 
seven-year-old a nasal swab well as a mother i don't know if i'm mm. shoving it back in there the way it, right. like you yes. say you could do it. you're a doctor i'm a mom not really wanting to get it up there yeah. and taking it easy so i mean are they that sensitive to where whatever you're getting yes, up there is what do you think be. dr Stevens? oh yeah like you said if you do a shallow and don't get to the back of the nose there's definitely can be a recovery issue you know and that's what and schools are telling people if their kids have young kids elementary kids to go you know you have to administer their test for them yeah. at CVS, and that I kind think of if concerning. they're positive, that's great. If they're negative and you're symptomatic and you're a little nervous, I think you don't really know. I think you need to go get a piece. That's how I would look at it, Hawkeye. Is yeah, that I think you know, we understand the sensitivity um, of the PCR test to be able to pick up even little amounts of infection. So I would, um, I would certainly recommend. Bob. All right, Amanda's asking, do we still consider obesity to be a comorbidity when it comes to fully vaccinated people being hospitalized if they get COVID? Or is it more the transplants, cancer patients, and severely in immunocompromised that you're talking about when you say comorbidity? Yeah, I would still certainly consider um, obesity a comorbid condition. Now, you may still create antibodies and have those T cell responses um, compared to somebody who's non-obese as opposed to, as you had mentioned early on in the question about solid organ transplants or other immunosuppressed. Um, but, you know, I think we still, that is still a comorbidity. That does not go away. That still lends you to have some underlying uh, reason to have continued you know inflammation we know that obese patients do have some sort of level of inflammation that just causes their uh, immune system or their other organs not to function as properly or as optimally as those who are not obese Anil is asking I have to fly for a sur yes our own Anil, uh, Neil who, he, Anil yep he has to fly for a surgery next month are there any new precautions to take other than double masking and eye protection I would hate to get all the way there and then test positive I don't think so. You know, I flew recently, and I, again, I think that masking and the eye protection are going to keep you protected. Um, when you are in the airport, you know, try to separate from other people as much as possible, certainly six feet or eight feet if you can. I know some of those uh, areas where you're boarding the plane do get a little bit dense, and so it's difficult to do that. Uh, but if you continue to do those things, you really should be safe. Here's what I was thinking over the weekend, you know. I can go to a crowded indoor restaurant with nobody masked, or I can go through a crowded airport with everybody masked. Mm -hmm. I think the airport's safer. Yeah. Now, 100%. you're pretty darn close at some times, um, yeah. but the airplanes themselves have done a good job of working on their airflow patterns so that it helps a little bit. Now, you know, we had said earlier in the, the pandemic, we weren't sure about flying, and then the data came out, hey, flying looks pretty good, watch out for airports. Um, uh, but everybody's masked, so that makes a big, that was a big win. I, you know, whether the Delta variant changes this story or not, I don't think we know yet, but at least the date, I'm not seeing any new evidence that says airplanes are a concern. And I think the risks around airports have dropped because of masking. So I, I'm, 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 I think you're okay. I would feel good about that. I want to, you know, you, you'd answered that question. I'm just going to drop back for a second and talk about obesity because um, also the CDC this last weekend went through the list of those diseases that are considered, uh, put you at high risk, and they categorize it into clearly, possibly, we think so, expert opinion, in other words, and, and we're, or, or we're not sure. You know, there are a couple of respiratory conditions, asthma, which had not been on the list originally, is yeah, now on the list. The yep, uh, asthma's on the list. Of course, diabetes, kidney failure, transplant, cancer, especially active chemotherapy is really the real risk. But obesity's still on that list, and uh, remember that obesity, especially as you get older, often travels with diabetes. And diabetics, diabetes and obesity together are clearly a risk. And oftentimes people with a little diabetes and, 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 and some obesity also have a little heart disease going on. They may have a little renal disease going on. So all of a sudden your risk gets magnified as you add in these other yeah, conditions. Yeah, I wanted to ask you about that, especially for obesity. We know there's just mechanical changes and just uh, physical changes, you know, difficulty expanding your lungs to get oxygen and breathe and all that. So I think that plays a major part as well. With well, what you already referred to also, there seems to be this kind of low grade level of inflammation in, in the setting of obesity we don't really understand entirely. And is that part of what's going on also? Bob, who are we giving the last question to? All right, time for one more and it's from Isaac. Our good friend Isaac, regarding some of the recent vaccinations, do you think that lots of people will skip their second dose just because they were very late and sometimes reluctant to get the first one? That's a concern of mine. 
Well, I hope not. Um, what we know is that about 90% of people who get their first dose get their second dose. So I think they'll continue to do it. There's a small percentage of patients um, who are not. Uh, most of these had such a difficult time with the first dose. But I, I, I think most people getting the first dose are getting the second dose. And again, in J&J, you only need one dose so far. That may change. Um, I think the next question will be, Will people be reluctant to get a third do dose, that booster, if in fact that ends up being recommended for certain disease uh, people, and maybe the age of, over the age of 65, which I'm not there yet, close though, mm -hmm. um, or those who have other health problems? Mm -hmm. and, and I think for I, I, hopefully people will get their third dose as well. But I suspect that most people will end up getting those those two doses. I do think again we're seeing a nationwide increase in vaccination. It's subtle, but it's real. I think people are scared about the Delta variant. Mm -hmm. And I, I also think, and I'm not trying to be political here, but I think there's a different message coming out of Washington, D.C. right now. And I do think it's starting to resonate a little yeah. bit. And when you see Missouri start to vaccinate a little more, uh, even Governor Parsons has come out in favor of it. Mm -hmm. so I, I do think there is a bit of a turning of the tide. Mm -hmm. We just need to get that tide to move a whole lot faster than it is right now. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I think that was a concern when we uh, saw people initially getting uh, a, the, the first dose of vaccine, then would they come back to get their second? Really getting that second confers uh, the maximal immunity that you can get. And it, again, it is okay if that is delayed, if you can't exactly get the three or four weeks of that second dose, depending on what company's mRNA vaccine you get. But no matter what, even if you are delayed in getting that, please get that second dose. Great questions today. Let's get to our final thoughts. Dr. Stevens, let's start with you. Get vaccinated. <laughs> I don't know what else there's to say. I mean, it's just, well, it's just think about how sad is it that, you know, we live in a country where we have vaccine expiring, you know, we're going to be throwing away and we have other countries that can't get the vaccine that are begging for it. I mean, I think that's the last thing I have to say about it. It's just amazing that people are still that reluctant when we know something that helps save lives. Dr. Hawkinson. Yeah, you know, I think um, we continue to promote the benefits of those non-pharmaceutical interventions. We know uh, there is very good research to support this and prove this. Masking does improve infection rates, cases, hospitalizations, and death. Same with the other uh, uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions, such as distancing as much as you can, doing things outdoors, hand hygiene. The other thing is vaccination. We still have a large segment of those younger kids, uh, 12 to 17, who haven't been vaccinated. Please get your children vaccinated. We know it's safe. There was just a um, uh, morbidity and mortality weekly report out of the CDC, that their, their publication from July 30th, which actually looks at vaccination rates and adverse events in those 12 to 17 year olds. In any um, you know, adverse reaction or symptoms after vaccination are very rare. So please, they are safe, they are effective, they, do, they will help decrease the amount of transmission. And more importantly, individually for your child, they are gonna help decrease their chance of having to go to the hospital, having long COVID even as a child. So please continue to get vaccinated. We still have some time before school starts. Back to you. You know, early on in this pandemic, we talked about the intersection of faith, hope, and science. Uh, faith in each other that we will make the right decision and, 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 and faith in our community that we can do, uh, beat this together. Hope uh, that we will get through this together and for new therapies and vaccinations and science as a vehicle which translates faith and hope into something meaningful for all of us to give us an answer. Um, to that, uh, we may want to think about tomorrow. You know, because really the reason we want, is we, but we have faith and we want to have hope and we need science is to deliver us to a safer tomorrow. Um, we can do that, but it takes all of us and our community to do that. And the way we get there, the way we get to tomorrow is by taking care of each other. And which this vaccine, which the Delta variant clearly demonstrates, is that takes all of us, not just half of us not just 30% of us. It really takes all of us. And that means vaccinations and masks. That's how tomorrow becomes the today we wanted to be in. So let's make tomorrow the today we want to aspire to. And we do that by taking care of each other and acting as if in fact we are a community of people bound together by faith and hope. Love it, well said. Okay, so my final thought today is to celebrate our CRNAs. They are celebrating Christmas a little bit early this year. They are donating to a nonprofit, Bags of Fun. Their mission is to deliver a bag of fun to every sick child whose health and happiness are 
compromised. The packs donated by the CRNAs at KU will go to pediatric patients here. So we appreciate all their hard work. And if you are not going to sing Garth Brooks for us out. I guess I, I'm not I, Okay. Yet. So maybe do a little rehearsing. We'll get to that later this week. Okay. We, <laughs> um, so thank you for being with us today. Tomorrow, we will look at breakthrough infections. A lot of you sending questions about that each and every week. We're going to hear from a local doctor who is fully vaccinated, yet she tested positive for COVID-19, what she believes was her Achilles heel. That is tomorrow morning. Now we're heading back to the freezer. Have a great day. This is Steve Stice, Chief Medical Officer at the University of Kansas Health System. I'm back in the freezer with my good friend, Dr. Hawkeye. Hi. We're here to make a point about masks. Doc Hawk, he's got his surgical mask on. I've got a cloth mask. But you know, all masks can help keep us safe. And you can tell you don't see our breath. We take our masks off, and what happens? Now we talk. There's our breath. We take a deep breath. Man, I've got your breath in my face. My mask doesn't work well here. What if we just put it under our nose? Does that really do any good? Not so much. So remember, let's keep each other safe. Let's keep our masks on.